habari gani wanakumbukeni karibuni welcome to those of you who do not speak the language yet but we will be providing you with lessons so that you can join us in speaking our african languages my name is nduko um i am one of the co-hosts on kumbukeni i am a black woman who is fed up with going along with the oppressive system while my community my brothers and sisters suffer under its influence and so therefore i have joined hands with my brother adisoji and alimadi to come and give you uh, an african perspective to what is happening in africa countering the false narrative that has been told for centuries about africa brother alimadi brother adisoji if you can please introduce yourselves greetings greetings global comrades and sisters and brothers welcome to combo kenny our global university our pan african open university where every week we examine some of the contemporary challenges and we try to tie it with our african experiences and history and we dig from lessons in the past that some of our hallowed ancestors offered so karibuni welcome welcome Talk to you, Lando. yes <laughs> Again, once again, good evening. Welcome to Kumbakeni, uh, reaching you all from London, the heart of empire, where everybody else pretends they want to ascribe to, and uh, also the land that gave you the language you're all conversing in right now, the English language. Uh, the name is Adesa Jiginla, and uh, again, welcome to Kumbakeni, where we decolonize our mind one topic at a time, and uh, today. I'll pass it on to, over to the host, uh, Nduko. Thank you. Um, so today, we've, we've had this conversation before on aid, but today we're going to focus on the harm, uh, specific harms that it, it causes, um, this idea of aid. And we have it there in, co in quotations because it's not quite uh, aiding to mm -hmm. African nations. So we'll be talking about the World Bank and IMF loans and foreign aid and how it has um, impacted African nations. Brother Limadi, um, this, this concept of um, aid being the essence of dependence and the antithesis of independence, right? We call ourselves independent African nations, but we really aren't, right? Correct. Especially as far as aid goes. Could you speak on this? Well, as you captured it, I don't even know, because part of the problem is that we don't examine the words Mm -hmm. that are used in our engagement uh, with the West. So aid is a misnomer because, first of all, aid is not supposed to be permanent. Think about that. That's a good point. So why is aid a permanent condition in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> now, that alone should give you enough you know, indication and clue. Uh, so that goes to say we need to examine many of the words that currently govern our relationship and engagement with the industrialized countries. I think concepts are very critical because it allows you to put things in perspective. So, for example, if you just woke up yesterday, yes, perhaps you can accept the word aid. You could be duped. You could be deceived. But... Functioning people in the world should not be like that. Mm -hmm. That is why the importance of history. Look at the historical relationship with the countries that are today the dominant ones and the ones that are dominated. It's not mm -hmm. by accident. Mm -hmm. So you can't exist without looking back and saying, what did slavery do when it comes to Africa's economies, right? We know the details, the captives, the torture, the massacre, the genocide, the taking away of the healthiest bodies, uh, Africa, mm. to the so-called new world. Mm -hmm. But what did it also do on the African continent itself? It disrupted the economic system. It reoriented Africa's economy to address the needs of the outside world. And that was the beginning of colonization, really by usurping our independence, right? Because now people are abandoned. In fact, those are the first times that we started having mass famine and starvation in African countries. Hmm. Because now agriculture is disrupted. The most able-bodied producers have been taken away. The most skilled farmers 
And that is the why they introduced their farming skills in places like Brazil. They became very, very efficient in farming because of African productivity. The same thing in what is now the United States. United States, yeah. Right? So then you can see uh, colonization as uh, slavery 2.0. The same disruption. The production is geared toward the needs of the industrialized world to fulfill the demand, the hunger in their factories. Now we are producing cash crops. Now, once again, we are facing famine because we are not producing <laughs> you know, food uh, to feed our people. Our economic production is not geared toward our domestic needs, external needs, right? So now, in the contemporary era, of so-called independence, which as we have discussed previously is independence on paper alone, we have once again slavery 3.0. And now foreign aid is what drives this dependent relationship. Our mm -hmm. economic relationship is still the same. We are still producing, not to satisfy our domestic needs primarily, but primarily for the outside world. We're still producing cash crops. Kenya, tea, Uganda, coffee, uh, Ghana, Ivory Coast, cocoa, cocoa, you name it, right? And uh, Comrade Adesoji will provide other examples of cash crops all over Africa. <laughs> but that is the primary need, mm. the pr primary production system that we have in most African countries. So even when there is so-called growth, it's not really development. When they talk about growth in African countries, it means for a period of time, the demand for the primary commodities are going to go up. The prices go up for a while. So we have more revenue. But the structural system is not changing. We're not having economic development per se. There's zero industrialization in Africa. Hmm. So foreign aid keeps that relationship intact. The relationship that we have during colonialism. The relationship that was set up during the era of slavery. We produce primary commodities for cheap, sell it for cheap. We sell our labor for cheap, and we consume the items manufactured from the factories. So think about it. Every year, you sell cheaper things in relative or relative terms. The price, you know, very cheap depend uh, relative to the manufactured items. Mm. So then what happens? Impoverishment increases. You need... Uh, you need foreign external financing to meet the deficit in your revenue. So now this is where foreign aid comes into play. So it means you're becoming much more indebted. You're becoming much more dependent, which means what? You need even more, more. foreign aid. And mm. this cycle just continues like that. And that is the role of the World Bank and the IMF. So for example, when the World Bank and IMF give you money, one of the conditions is that you do not put it into industrialization. Mm -hmm. In fact, since the 1980s in particular, when the World Bank came up with something called the Berg Report, and I encourage Africans to read that uh, report, the Berg Report. Prior to that, the World Bank policy geared toward African countries was primarily what's called uh, project-based loans. So if you had some projects for bridges, for roads, uh, they would examine that, and then they would say, okay, this is feasible, we'll finance it. But since the 1980s, it's been what they call policy-based financing. Oh. Policy-based now comes into, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do, and that is why increasingly African countries have become much, much more dependent and captive to Western uh, external uh, I don't even know what to call it. I'm hesitant to use the word aid. <laughs> but uh, back to you, <laughs> Sister Andu. I guess you can call it financial dependence because there that's what go. it literally is. Go. Brother Adesoji, any thoughts on this one? The dependence and uh, of aid and antithesis of uh, independence. Aid being the dependence. Um, I mean, uh, if anything, it would just be to buttress the point where Dr... Um, um, Brother Milton said, um, you keep creating that spiral. One is before you even get the money, you're asked to devalue your currency. It is 
in the cost of in the cost of devaluing your currency, you're making goods that are already so cheap, extra cheap. Guess who gets impoverished? Yep. The one who is making the stuff cheap. And then they will buy it for pennies. And then because you're not industrialized, you'll be forced to buy it at market prices. And so here the circle just keeps spinning like your washing machine, the drum in your washing machine. So you're feeding the beast. You're not exactly getting anything from it. So, I mean, if anything, that's all I will add to it at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. And Alimadi, as we did our research and as we were speaking, you had Uganda as one of the ex examples, the land reform in Uganda. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Uganda is the archetypical neo-colonial captive state. Uganda today in the 21st century is what uh, Congo was in the 20th century under uh, Field Marshal uh, Mobutu. Mobutu Sesiseko. Yes, and so Field Marshal Museveni is reproducing the same um, absolute model. A country that has a corrupt regime yet still gets $1 billion every year in U.S. taxpayer financing. So this is bilateral. And then it also gets, uh, a, over the last three years, it's gotten uh, almost uh, $2 billion from both the World Bank and the IMF. Yet Uganda is a uh, uh, dependent African country hmm. which produces coffee, which uh, you used to produce significant quantities of uh, cotton as well, although that's not as important as coffee is today, but which also produces something else which is important uh, to the Western countries, which is an armed force that can be rented out as a regional police force uh, for the United States and for Britain. So because the United States fears that Somalia can uh, collapse into the control of uh, the movement called Al-Shabaab, mm. which the United States says is uh, allied to Al-Qaeda. So what uh, Marshal Museveni has done is to deploy uh, about 10,000 Ugandan soldiers in Somalia. So the United States does not have to uh, deploy its own boots on the ground. So that is one of the reasons why, uh, regardless of the uh, human rights abuse within the country, regardless of stealing elections, regardless of uh, uh, embezzling funds. Uh, look, the price of food uh, has escalated in the country. People are starving. And yet, uh, Marshall Museven is flying around in a Gulf Stream presidential jet, which is worth $50 million. I don't think even Donald Trump flies in a <laughs> Gulf Stream. <laughs> but it's worth $50 million, right? Uh, and that is subsidized by uh, foreign aid. So the other thing it does is also, and I know uh, Comrade Edison, he wants to elaborate on this also in his um, uh, own discussion. It maintains these type of corrupt autocratic <laughs> regimes in African countries. He does not have to uh, face the wrath of Ugandans because he's insulated <laughs> by this access to a billion dollars in U.S. taxpayers' money, um, uh, a couple of other billions over a period of time from the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, so you have a, a government that does not have to care, take care of the needs of its citizens, and that is why you find uh, students, uh, and it's not a bad idea that the students have to sit out uh, uh, underneath trees <laughs> Uh, to to be to take instruction in schools, you know. But uh, the students think that you know their parents did that because <laughs> you know the conditions were different during colonial rule mm. in the century. Mm. Students would prefer to sit in uh, in modern classrooms with computers in front of them to experience proper education. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, you wonder then what is being done with all the money, and that is when the embezzlers, embezzlement, and corruption comes in into our play as well. Hmm.
Yeah, as we as we, it's a good segue that you you built up there as we talk about the uh, embezzlement, Adisoji. If you can, please speak some more about the corruption and unrest that aid fuels in Africa. Well, um, just to maybe uh, first things first, I think we we've put the cart before the um, the cart before the horse. Mm-hmm. I think we need to understand the genesis of these organizations. Okay. That will inform whether they are acting according to intent or they're, you know, they've just speak gone to off. It. The- yes, please speak to it. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the Second World War, the earlier phases of the Second World War, uh, President Roosevelt called um, Winston Churchill and uh, said, um, we need to find a way that the so-called powers would no longer have to go to war in order to settle their differences. Uh, In speaking, they came up with what was known as the Atlantic Charter. That Atlantic Charter would come up with three prongs ideas, which is, uh, first, it will come up with an idea that will born three ideas. So the idea was multilateralism. So which essentially means while we exist, there must be a forum for us to be able to manage the affairs politically, economically, and on defense. Mm -hmm. So that gave birth to the United Nations in 1945, the IMF in 1947, before then the World Bank in 1946, and also the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. G-A-T-T. That was 1948. In the same 1948 will be the birth of NATO. Now, how they all come into play will get in in the course of our discussion. So that said, the remit for the World Bank and the IMF was simply help balance the level of trade between the powers because at that time, Most of the African countries were not yet independent. So they were about to come into independence. But there is one underlying event that often gets missed. And the event was the fact that following the Second World War, Europe needed to rebuild. And in order to do so, they needed to sign up to what was then known as the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. So the Marshall Plan was financed largely by the United States. In order to do so, you had to provide something as collateral. Guess what those countries provided as collateral? It was the colonies. So when they came out of colonization into independence, they were already saddened with debt owned on their behalf, but to on the master's behalf by, you know, quote unquote, by the African countries. Now, so every time you had one African country come in, they effectively were signing up to the idea that, yes, I owe this debt and I was going to pay it. Even though at the time you were just a body of people, you were not a country. Now, why is that important in sense of feeding the narrative of corrupt leaders and what have you. France, in granting independence under the government of, uh, what's his name again? His name escapes me. De Gaulle. Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle, yes. He went around with a document and that document essentially said, "If if you wanted independence, yes, France will grant you independence, but on certain preconditions. And that would burn what was then known as Franc Afrique. So essentially you had Frenchmen, but they were in Africa. And so some of them agreed, with the exception of uh, a gentleman in Guinea, who said we would rather starve in dignity than to have freedom that bounds us in slavery. So, that's, that said, fast forward 
the 60s, 70s, 80s. Every leader that was pro-people became anti the West in terms of econo economic uh, matters. So you had the likes of Samara Machel taken out, uh, Thomas Sankara of late. Not all of them were killed, of course. Some of them were toppled, the likes of Kwame Nkrumah. Um, his name escapes me now. Um, what's his name? Patrice Lumumba was actually killed because he specifically, yes, he specifically he spoke... was not killed, but he was marginalized. Yes. So he spe uh, Lumumba specifically spoke to the concept that it is time that African countries and African people in general determine their own agency. And that, to the West, was basically pushing back against the notion of what those countries were set up for. Essentially, we have to understand that those countries, I mean, we've used the phrase before, they were just plantations, colonial plantations, but in Africa. And they still are economic plantations at the moment. So that is the essence of what most of these countries represent to the West. So anytime any leader speaks to the notion of industrializing, someone like uh, Julius Nyerere actually did so. But because every time he spoke, they knew he made sense and they knew his country was not going to buy into anything other than what the Malimo spoke to, teacher in Swahili. They essentially played along until he ended up, you know, leaving power. And once he left power, the guy who followed through immediately acquiesced to the, West, to the French, to the West wishes. And so we are here today talking about how these organizations have, improv have impoverished Africa, not because Africans refused or agreed to, but because certain agreements, one like the one Brother Milton spoke about earlier, have set in motion the narrow remit for most of these leaders to come in. And because you have no economic power per se, it's difficult to do anything out of the present framework. All right. So I just want to make a few uh, comments also on what, uh, you know, the brother just enumerated. So, for example, the Marshall Plan, right? Obviously, the Marshall Plan, that was perhaps something we can see as aid. It did not come with money that says you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. I think what they probably said was that you cannot have communists in your government. <laughs> oh, really? Because after the war the Red Scare. was devastated, communist and socialist parties were actually very strong mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. becoming increasingly stronger. And the United States feared that. That if that happens, that's going to end up in our doorsteps as well. So let's give them the money. And they did. They gave them $13 billion. Um, they didn't come with the kind of conditions that the World Bank gives to African countries today. And that $13 billion is worth 150 in today's money. And it was given as a grant. They did not have to pay. So you can imagine what African countries could accomplish if they were given $150 billion today to finance industrialization, mm -hmm. the impact. So that is also a good way. I'm glad you brought that up because it shows the contrast between how aid was applied when being dispersed to fellow Europeans as opposed to how so-called aid is dispersed to African countries. And you also mentioned a couple of other interesting things like um, the United Nations all of them instruments of domination. How is the power of the numbers that African uh, countries have? We have the numbers, right, in the General Assembly. Assembly yep. That is neutralized by? The Security Council. Security Council. And the irony is that African countries help the People's Republic of China 
to be admitted in the UN in 1971, because before that it was Taiwan, right? Which was supported by the United States and Western countries. So Taiwan had to be expelled for China to become the recognized representative as the People's Republic of China. And today China is a member of the Security Council. So China owes Africa actually quite a bit. Exactly. China should aid Africa in getting representation on the Security, on the Security Council. Council. China should help African countries in industrializing. China should not replicate the relationship that the industrialized Western countries have with Africa, which is just come and access raw material and mm. take it back to build wealth in China. Mm. We need a different type of relationship with China. I mean, oh, go on. No, no, because uh, his comments just reminded me of this other point. And then mm. the final one, of course, is the general agreement of tariffs and trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is now been replaced by the WTO, WTO yep. the World Trade Organization, which, of course, among many of the very pernicious policies, one we have discussed in the past, which precludes African countries from subsidizing and supporting their farmers, mm -hmm. which, of course, is one of the conditions also that correlates with the World Bank, you know, uh, preventing African governments from subsidizing mm -hmm. other social programs. Yet, on the other hand, the Western the countries subsidize their farmers. Yeah. See? So they say to African countries, you should not bother industrializing because you have an advantage in agricultural production. So produce and sell that to the world. But how can we sell when you're subsidizing your farmers? In fact, the opposite is now happening. Instead of these countries opening up their markets to Africa's agricultural products, because Africa is mm -hmm. open to all their manufactured products, they do the opposite thing. So as a result, Africa is dependent on manufactured products, but Africa is also dependent on food. Mm -hmm. Africa imports $13 billion worth of food every year. Think about that. Yep. That is a tragedy of the kind of relationship that we have. But you know, at the end of the day, we can complain as much as we want, Again, the change has to come from the leadership in African countries. Yes. Which mm -hmm. means, and then we'll get into that later on, I know. Yes, <laughs> yes. I was about to say, we'll talk about oh, the underdevelopment. That is a whole, which work is coming next. But before we move to that, I also want to point out this irony of the West talking about countering corruption in Africa while giving the aid directly to the corrupt African uh, governments. It's the hypocrisy. I agree. Yes, right. If you are indeed aiding Africa and you, for a couple of years, give aid or however many years, give aid to Africa directly to the government and you notice that there's misuse of funds, why would you continue to do that? Why would you not figure out a different strategy to aid Africa? And so that and the fact that they, could, they have actually upheld corrupt governments using this aid, which uh, because uh, and also resulting in unrest in Africa because you have these rich old men who are fighting for power because there's a price there. There's a reward. If you're the one in government, you're going to be getting access to this money that is given to government. So you have these coups and people wanting to be in that position of um, of receipt of this money. Um, and I, I want to make two points on that. If you yes, don't mind. please. Yes. A U.S. senator who is very close to President Biden. Mm -hmm. You know, I met at a sort of a, a semi-social setting. It was informal, you know, sort of business gathering. Hmm. Told me that the United States knows that uh, Field Marshal Museveni insists on remaining president because he believes yep. that is the only way he can protect himself, his family, and their ill-gotten wealth. True. Imagine. So they know it explicitly. And then the second point to go to what you just said. I covered a case here in New York in 2018, December, a federal trial. I think I've mentioned this in the past, where a Chinese uh, wheeler dealer was convicted for bribing uh, Field Marshal Museveni and his uh, foreign minister uh, at the time named Sam Kutesa. One million dollars. Now, to most people, that doesn't sound like a lot of money compared to the amount of money that they normally steal. And it's true. But it was to begin 
the business dealings. Part of the arrangement was that uh, a very big Chinese company was going to go into Uganda and get concessions in oil, concessions in tourism, and concessions into building a railway, and concessions mm. into building a casino <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on an island on, uh, on Lake Victoria. And the businesses... Uh, Museveni's family and Kutesa's family were supposed to be uh, in partnership with them. Not the country, but their private businesses. Uh, so he was tried. His name is Patrick Ho. And he was convicted. And why was he tried in a New York federal court? Because he had used a U.S. bank to wire some of the money to Uganda. He sent 500000 via wire transfer. So it mm -hmm. gave the U.S. jurisdiction. But Museveni, much smarter than his foreign minister, he insisted that his be delivered in cash. So uh, Patrick Ho flew to Uganda in a Gulfstream jet as well, <laughs> similar to Museveni's, and delivered the 500000 in cash. As he should. In a United States court. Did that cost anything in the relationship with the, between the U.S. and, the, uh, and, and Uganda? No. Nope. Absolutely none. No. Zero. In fact, it was after that conviction in 2018 of Patrick Ho that the monies from the World Bank and IMF actually even went up to Museveni. And the annual US $1 billion uh, in uh, so-called aid still continues uninterrupted, even after that case <laughs> in a US court. So that is the best confirmation that so-called foreign aid is not really meant to benefit the African people at all. Mm. I think you're muted, sister. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, when we talk about corruption, bad leadership, uh, and we have a dictionary for that, uh, Museveni should be the picture alongside that. But let's move on to talking about underdevelopment and what aid does to result in that in Africa. We're talking about the health, um, education system, public service system, the farmers, agriculture in Africa, uh, the conditionality of the aid that uh, uh, stops or hinders industrialization, policies. Um, let's talk about this. Let's start with health, education, and public service. Brother Adesoji, um, speak to this. Okay, so it is at this moment we need to pause. Mm -hmm. uh, pause why? 43 years ago on Tuesday, June 13, 1980, was the assassination of Brother Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney, in his uh, great book, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, mm -hmm. which sister has over there, uh, underscores the importance of education. Why so? Education, as he puts it in the colonial framework, is not meant to empower you. It's not meant to act as a liberator and is not meant to be a vehicle of development. It is essentially to recreate, basically, subservient Africans. You're referring, would, I just said you're referring to the current education, right? Not education. I'm referring, yeah, concept. because yeah, okay. the current, the colonial education is what morphed into the mm -hmm. education you currently have right now. Mm -hmm. None of those African countries have re-evaluated their economy, um, their educational curriculum. Mm -hmm. I... Sorry, brother, but before I forget, I have to interject and then continue. <laughs> who the Minister of Education in Uganda is? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, you go ahead and tell them, because we know. Go ahead and tell That's them. That's one guess. The wife. Yes. Mrs. Yeah, is she, a is she a teacher? Is the no, Minister of Education. She's a wife. That's what she is. That's what yes, qualifies when her. in fact, the wide, broad conversation in Uganda is that somebody wrote her paper for her, uh, for her to get the degree at Makere University. She is the Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. Okay, please proceed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't follow on that, but I will try. Okay, so... <laughs> Nepotism at its highest level. Hey. Um, so that being the case, most of these, most of the African countries still have a largely pre-colonial educational framework. Yeah. So 
if you look through from the sciences through to the arts through everything is still eurocentric so on that basis there is really no avenue for those countries to reach out a path mm -hmm. to development and so in terms of education when the countries seek the attention or the favor from the IMF or the World Bank, one of the first things that is often on the table is, or first of three things that are on the table is education, health, infrastructure, and maybe down the ladder, the civil service. Yes. Now here's the problem. Definitely civil service. So here's the problem with each three of uh, those four, these four facts, these four issues, and how they go largely to impede the development of these organizations. One, if your population is generally undereducated, what that means is you have a, a, a non-professional workforce. So essentially means any company that comes in basically will dictate how much your wages will be. And you know what that means, Egal. That's slavery by another name. In terms of health, the examples are replete. During the 80s, when AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, was the scourge of African countries, especially in the southern, southern part of the continent, the Pharmaceutical companies in the United States will take out a lawsuit to sue governments for daring to go and seeking cheap drugs in India. Why did they do this? Because most of these countries don't have a functional lab nor a pharmaceutical industry. So they had to go to where the drugs were cheap for the people in order to ensure that the Africans survive. And, you know, that became the order. Fast forward 2020, at the height of the COVID, African countries, again, were told to wait. We will get to you. What happened? Places like Canada, places like United Kingdom, the United States bought six seven times, eight times the needs of their population in terms of vaccine, robbing the rest of the African countries. Bearing, when the um, COVID started, the clamor then was, oh, I wonder how Africa will survive because they were going to, they're really going to, they're really going to suffer. Because if they don't get the support that they need, where are they going to get the money from? Well, the ancestors were listening. And uh, suffice to say, COVID became much more of a Western phenomenon rather than the Southern Hemisphere, with the exception of Brazil, of course. Now, there is one issue going back to the notion of the civil service. If you don't have a functioning civil service, one that looks out for the interests of the general population in terms of service delivery, your workers, your council workers, your teachers, your doctors, if you don't have a functioning civil service, how is this country supposed to carry on? They have a solution for that. Guess what they do? They send you experts, embedded wall. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. They've got experts from the West. Mm -hmm. Which then brings us to this issue, or this question rather. If that is the case, and these are experts before their name, they're doctors and letters, they're cruising around in four by fours, living plush houses, they've got servants to tender to the every whim and caprice of theirs. <clears throat> if that is the case, how come there is not one success story in terms of their intervention? I mean, it can't sound like a rhetorical question, but it's actually a true question. 
that must be posed to these experts anytime they turn up, preferring tested solutions. You know, so I'm sure Brother Milton would have sure. <laughs> something to to say to that. But it is quite shocking that this has been allowed to fester for a very, very long time. Yeah, sister, you're muted. All right, I need to stop muting myself. So, and before I, I keep doing it, not to interrupt the two of you with my writing noise, but I need to stop it. Before we, we move on to you, Brother Milton, the one thing that comes to mind as Adisoji is speaking and as we continue the conversation is Amos Wilson. Uh, this notion that Africa is poor and needs aid. Amos Wilson asks, how can it be that Africa is poor while it is the provider of resources? Why would anyone go to ask a poor man for resources? They essentially do not have anything to give you. The West keeps coming to Africa to ask for things. Why would China go to Africa because China has an increased population and they need uh, energy, fuel? Why would they go to Africa if Africa was poor? And this is something that African leaders and African people need to ask themselves. Why do we see ourselves as poor when everyone is coming to ask to ask for stuff? Yeah, I have, so somebody posted, and I guess we can get into that later on, in terms of the importance of education, education and educating the mind. Mm -hmm. Because it's the narrative of impoverishment. The narrative of uh, featuring, uh, you know, small children with dissented bellies, hmm. uh, you know, shriveled limbs, and that becomes the representative image of Africa on TV. And saying, oh, you need to donate so we can, you know. And that becomes the narrative of Africa as dependent. Uh, not the narrative of Africa as exploited, which is exactly the, the case. Kuma said Africa's uh, poverty is artificial. But it means that conversely, our Western wealth is also artificial. It means the Western wealth is being subsidized mm -hmm. by the exploitation of Africa. That's the other side of that coin. Uh, so the brother said a couple of things also that I wanted to add on to when it comes to health and education. And there's a documentary which needs to be updated that I recommend. It's on YouTube. It's called The End of Poverty, with a question mark at the end, by Philip Diaz. And his last name is D-I-A-Z. You know, I teach it in my classes at John Jay, and I tweet often about it. And I think one or two times, you know, he... Um, acknowledge my tweet and even retweeted it. I hope he makes an updated version because it's been a while since he did the documentary. But there's an interesting part of the documentary where he's interviewing a young Kenyan, a young Kenyan who was uh, expelled from school. Mm. And he lives in the uh, so-called slums, Kibera, in Nairobi. And he was talking about the humiliation of not being able to go to school. Mm -hmm. Even when he used to go to school, you know, the humiliation of always being hungry and not having money uh, to buy food and other students laughing at him. Mm -hmm. And then they also talk in the documentary, they talk to a Kenyan healthcare uh, official who is saying people are now dying of the most simple diseases, including malaria, because uh, in order for the World Bank to give uh, money to Kenya, Kenya had to remove subsidies on health care. So people could not even go to the clinics or hospitals now if they didn't have money. And they would die of very common diseases. And then it switches back to that same young man who had said he was expelled from school. He's saying um, any time for any ailment they have, they have to go to the corner store and get aspirin. So aspirin now, <laughs> to treat <laughs> anything mm. and everything. I, I am witness to that. I, uh, I... It's a very uh, gut-wrenching documentary, but it's worth watching because it really tells you about how uh, the majority uh, population in this world uh, really lives. So I wanted to add that to what the brother said. And uh, the brother also talked about the, uh, the industry that is sustained by mm -hmm. so-called foreign aid. And one of the largest industry uh, are the employees. Mm 
of the World Bank and the IMF, high paying jobs that these officials have, they're dependent on those positions, them and their families. Uh, so they're the ones actually, the elite uh, officials are the ones who are the primary benefits of this, uh, uh, of this system. And then also in Dambisa Moyo's book, Dead Aid, uh, she discusses one other aspect, the different departments responsible for dispersing uh, so-called foreign aid uh, to African countries, if they don't uh, lend out the entire amount that they have in their budget for, that, for the following year, then the following year, uh, no, for the current year, then the following year, the budget is going to shrink. <laughs> uh, and it could mean that the staff could also be reduced. So they have an incentive uh, just to lend for the sake of lending. <laughs> Hmm. Yes, I just wanted to add those. Oh, wait, one other point. Okay. Uh, Brother so you talked about the civil service. Look at this. They insist that you cut the civil service. They say trimming the fat, right? Mm -hmm. There's one service they never insist on cutting. And in fact, it is the most destructive and harmful service in almost every African country. And that is the armed the mi forces. military. Yeah. There's no yes. protest. When they buy these tanks, these jet fighters, they build these big armies, well-staffed, and the armies, ironically, are rarely used to defend any single African country from mm. a foreign invasion. Instead, they're used to brutalize the domestic citizens and to keep in place these autocrats. This is another thing that's being subsidized by the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, so, one other one other thing before before we before we move before you add quickly just to clarify on brother alimadi's point what you're saying is these foreign governments are keeping africa in a state where they they cannot walk out of aid because number one they are putting requirements conditions on industrializing stopping you from doing that right yep. but at the same time to these foreign aid um companies will call them they are saying you have to keep giving money because if you don't you lose so they're keeping people in that cycle of being dependent and having to continue giving aid right that's what you're saying brother alimadi absolutely uh, uh without a doubt that is how the system uh you know has been functioning mm -hmm. in fact you know they really have blood on their hands because if you ignore corruption if you know the brutality that is meted on africans by the police forces and by the armed forces, and yet you say cut subsidies for education, cut subsidies uh, for health, cut subsidies for food, cut subsidies uh, for fuel, what are you doing? You're actually killing Africans. That's what you're doing. Yeah. So we can't only blame those autocrats. Of course, we blame them, but we also look must look at the people who subsidize finance and maintain those autocrats in Africa who frustrate the legitimate aspirations of African people. Brother Desoji, go on. Yes. Um, I was going to add, Brother Milton brought up a uh, very uh, a key word. There's an entry point to actually some of the underlying problems that brings in the IMF and the World Bank. The issue of land. Right. Mm, 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 mm. The issue of don't get me going. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when you mention when you mention Kibera, mm. Kibera is considered to be one of the largest, uh, for want of a better word, slums on the African continent, mm -hmm. and its origin lies in colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now. Here was the here here is the issue. The first inhabitants of Kibera, Kibera in itself was actually a shooting range for the British armed forces. Mm -hmm. And so because they were displacing people from land, they needed people to help quell the rebellion. And so they brought in Sudanese. Now the Sudanese cannot live with the local population. And they also live with the Europeans because of the exclusion zones. So they ended up in 
on the gun range, which then started extending, extending, lateral, uh, eastwards, westwards, to what it is today. Now, why is that important? That's important in the sense that everywhere you had governments trying to do land reforms, you had the World Bank and the IMF coming in and saying, well, the money cannot go towards that. Now, I'll give you an example. The only country that successfully did took back its land without anyone. I mean, you will scurry the history books for it right now. But there's a very good book. The name escapes me. When I remember it, I'll put it in the chat. It was Libya. Libya expelled 35,000 Italians in 1969. And nobody knows about it. Why? Because they were sitting on prime property. Gaddafi, in coming to power, removing King Farouk of Libya at the time, said, Libyan lands has to be for Libyans. You cannot be in your own land and be subjugated. It was, it was land that was also the genesis and the basis of war in, uh, what's it called? In Algeria, with the FLN. What did they do that was so... <laughs> I mean, you can make this stuff up. They took land from people who use land to plant food, subsistence farming, and they turned it into land where they were planting grapes for their wines. Bearing in mind, this is a largely Islamic country. So you're effectively planting <laughs> a wine, grapes for your winery on their land and so obviously they rose up you know Dito the same thing in Kenya which is still an ongoing situation yep. Dito Zimbabwe which then led to the sanctions by the West how dare you and is the subject of an ongoing conversation in Namibia and South Africa right so that issue of land is key to understanding how these guys move on the African continent, where land is involved and, a, and quote unquote, the imperialist uh, population are still there, you will find terms of advancing aid, advancing whatever help, being tied to the comfort of this population. So, brother Milton, you wanted to add something. Uh, well, I mean, I'll hopefully not starting you off. <laughs> you've captured it. Everything is uh, is uh, under captivity. The land mm. and the resources contained in the land mm. and the people and the ability to produce what they want, not what the outside world needs. Mm. That is still captive. That is a continuation, and that's why I made the tie-in with slavery. And you see how it's just taken different forms, right? Yes, yes, yes. The land, the resources on the land, the people, and the dependency. In other words, you're not independent to produce what you need to satisfy your own needs. Can you imagine <laughs> if the United States, workers in this country, produced goods and services to satisfy the needs of a foreign entity, and then whatever is left over, perhaps, go into their own domestic needs. Mm. In fact, they had a system like that. Mm. That was during the British uh, colonial rule of what is now the United States. United States, yeah. And they rebelled against that. The Boston Tea Party. They started producing for their own domestic needs. And that was the essence of independence. Africa does not produce for its own domestic needs. So when we talk about Africans being independent, we're deluded. We're deluding ourselves. If you're independent, the first thing you do, do you wake up one day and say, oh, let me cook what my neighbor wants to eat? <laughs> and then if my neighbor allows me, maybe I can eat the leftover? Scraps. Mm -hmm. You wake up. And whatever you have, whether it's literal or not or, or a lot, you decide that today I feel like frying some eggs for myself. 
because they have eggs in the fridge, right? Today, I feel like making some porridge for myself because you have a little porridge or a lot of porridge, but you are making the decision to satisfy your needs. So now you wake up every day saying, I'm going to go to the pea plantation in Kenya to produce, to satisfy the appetite. I was about to say queen, now king in England. And his <laughs> May you not forget that before you know, they strike come on, you. Come on. We have to break it in these simple terms so that our mm -hmm. people realize mm -hmm. that we are not independent. What happened is they allowed some elite to inherit the state and the elite are accommodating and accepting and fulfilling the wishes of the interest of the former colonizers. And now and then we have new beneficiaries of this arrangement, <laughs> which of course is China. Yeah. China is just coming because the arrangement is already there. They produce, African countries produce raw materials that are cheap, mm. natural or mineral resources. They produce labor, which is cheap. The Europeans have been taking advantage of it. So we're getting into the act as well. And that's why I say we have to convince China that you can't play that same game. And, you know, and we helped and you join the United Nations. We helped you when you had very few ideological friends mm. in the 60s and 70s. Now, don't come and just take resources from Africa. Come and give the technology that African countries need to build up their industries so that they can also produce manufactured products. Instead, mm. the percentage of industrialization keeps going down every mm. year in African countries, you know. There's not a single African country that's industrialized. Yeah, and and just to show that what Brother Limadi is saying is not just theory or, or a concept that he, he has imagined, uh, in Kenya you will drive in certain places and you will see vast pieces of land belonging to one family, vast pieces of, and when you ask, you will hear, all the land that you will hear about that is that large is either the colonialists or the families of leadership that has been uh, in place in Kenya since colonialism. So again, going to that um, that truth, the fact of uh, that elitists, the elites are the ones who take over uh, the, the the resources in Africa, um, and it doesn't go to the masses. And this is a country that is healthy; it has good land. They can produce food, uh, but they're not not doing so because that land is being used to produce for the West. Um, the policy interference, I wanted to talk about a little bit about this before we, we go into the questions from our audience. The fact that these entities, be it the national uh, entities that give uh, aid to Africa, have this requirement of having representatives from their governments in African nations, in African governments, controlling policy, wherein African governments' policies are not necessarily being driven by African government needs or African nation needs. Can we speak to this policy and the, the harm it has on African nations and African people? Okay, just quickly before I say something on that also, mm -hmm. I just wanted to, uh, I, I went to uh, Zimbabwe, I think it was 2009, with uh, New York City Council member Charles Barron. Um, at that time, it seemed imminent that Britain was uh, mobilizing trying to get other African countries to invade Zimbabwe because that whole <laughs> land, uh, the land was taken and given back to Africans by Mugabe's government. So I felt it was so imminent. I wanted to help highlight uh, their profile, the government's profile in the United States. And I know Charles Barron is really connected to the grassroots. <laughs> so in fact, I connected him with some Zimbabwe officials and he actually invited uh, Mugabe to City Hall here in New York. And Mugabe came and spoke. And here's the most interesting thing. <laughs> you know, the papers were condemning him, what he was doing to Europeans in Zimbabwe, blah, 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 including the New York Post. So when Mugabe came to City Hall, the Post was there, the Daily News was there, New York Times was there. And then he spoke. And, you know, that's so funny because many of the reporters come with this stereotypical Conception. size image of an African, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then the guy comes there and he speaks English, you know, probably better than anybody who was in City Hall on that day, right? <laughs> and then he broke the historical and economic analysis. And he says, by the way, they don't tell you in your papers, but 
even though Africans only controlled about seven to ten percent, right, mm. of the land, mm. agricultural land, and it was not even the most productive ones, they were producing seventy percent of the food that was consumed in the country on that land. Hmm. Nobody ever told you about that, right? So at the end, he said, okay, now you can take some questions. <laughs> it was not a single one question asked. And I was there at the press conference because they'd come with the kind of question, so why are you doing this to Europeans? Why are you attacking white farmers? Blah, 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 blah. But he, when he broke down the history and the statistics, then they were caught off guard. How do we ask the questions now presented with these facts in front of us? That's number one. Number two, I also want to say this, because you spoke about land in Kenya. Mm. When we visited Zimbabwe, there's one section we drove for a few miles and just looking, there's this beautiful land on one side of the road. And then one of our guides said, oh, by the way, this farm belongs to Ian Smith. <laughs> and it still belonged to him at that time. And then we went, so, so oh, no, no, we got to visit this farm. So we went there and we found, you know, his employees, you know, living under impoverished conditions, of course, while he has this uh, sort of majestic house on the same farm. He wasn't there, of course, himself. But the expanse of the land and the size of the land was just astounding. While on the other hand, here you're being told that the majority of the population only controlled less than 10% of the land. Mm. And they were using that to produce uh, about 70% uh, of the land that was being uh, uh, consume. So I wanted to just uh, to make that also update. And then you asked the question of the uh, Western officials from the World Bank and IMF oh, see, yeah. mm -hmm. embedded in African ministries, including the Ministry of uh, the Treasury Ministry or Ministry of Finance. But that is not surprising, given the, the narrative that we've gone through today, yeah. you know, which shows clearly that these countries are not really uh, independent. So I don't see I don't see why any would, of them would object to have hmm. a Western official from the World Bank actually having an office in the ministries of finance okay. or the ministries of foreign affairs. That's just a fact of the matter, you know. Yeah, and to and to speak their language, it is like going to war and assigning positions in your military to foreigners who are your enemies. Absolutely. So, you know, you know it's a, a war uh, whose outcome has already been determined and it's definitely not under your direction. And True. also, just one final point on that same concept of foreign, so-called foreign aid. Many of the governments in African countries are not representative governments. And by this, I mean governments that are not, uh, don't have the mandate of the population, the electorate. Many countries, they have sham elections where, you know, you know, in Uganda, it's almost comedic. The guy's been there 38 years, you know, ramshackle elections. <laughs> and yet, they sign to take out the so-called foreign aid. And the working people, working class, are the ones who are obligated to pay the taxes to service these loans that they don't benefit an iota from. This is the most exploitative kind of relationship. Imagine if the United States had an unrepresentative government. Well, some people would argue that, you know, perhaps in some form, <laughs> they do have that, you know, problem in this country as well. But it's not to the extreme that we have in many of our countries. But I'm just trying to try to, you know, imagine the U.S. not having a representative government, leadership that is not really duly mm. elected. And yet they are negotiating to take loans on behalf of the United States from Britain or from France or from China and American citizens, workers having to pay those loans. Do you think Americans would really accept those kind of conditions? There so we need to educate our streets. African masses. Mm -hmm. This is unconscionable, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you need to do to remove these governments that impose these kind of exploitations foreign and domestic upon our citizens. Yeah. Uh, speaking of embedded experts, uh, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the first moves by um, Thomas Sankara was the fact to ask uh, World Bank and they were largely World Bank experts to leave. Uh, 
because as he puts it, uh, you've been here since 1960. Uh, Burkina Faso is still the way it is. So let the people get to work. And then one of his, in one of his speeches, he said, if you do not build your own home, how do you expect people to come in and help you build it? Boom. Thank you for that. You know, so, of course, we all know <laughs> the ears were listening. But in the short time he was there for that four years, railways, dams, schools, hospitals, health centers were built across the country. And fast forward now, actually, one of his grand plans at the time was when now you say global warming is a buzzword, everybody is talking about it, ooh, climate change and everything. Sankara actually instituted a tree planting uh, policy, which was that even if you want to go and propose to go and ask for the hand of your wife in marriage, instead of taking expensive uh, goods, expensive, take along trees, sampling, uh, tree, uh, tree samplings, and plant trees in the compound of your in-laws. And that was actually, you know, it was actually embraced so much so that the framework of what he intended to do, which was plant trees from Ugadugu, which is on the west of uh, Africa, to the east of Africa, which was a plan that was then taken up by, uh, what's the lady's name? Uh, Mathai Wag, um, Wagari Mathai. Wagari Mathai. So that would now form, if you Google it, will form what is called the green belts around Africa. So it essentially goes from one side of Africa to the other side of Africa. And but what is curious is the fact that his name is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Sankara's name is not mentioned. Because without Sankara, you would not have the framework for that idea. And just in your words, Adesoji, we should have a show just about that so that we can carry on our, our Baba's work and make it known that he's the one who started it. So he just goes to speak to how you have the so-called experts in places where they're making laws, not making laws necessarily, they're making policies that our own governments have to buy into because if they don't, they won't get the money. Mm -hmm. And then the money then becomes another issue, which brings me to the issue of capital flights. Uh, in the early 2000s, I said 2000s, yeah, uh, sorry, between 2016 to 2020, there was an issue making the rounds, the Panama Papers, Panama Papers, Panama Papers. Mm -hmm. Most of the money that got siphoned in those uh, exposés were money that came from developmental aid that found themselves into Western banks. Where was the issue post 9-11 where if you wanted to move any amount beyond $5,000, you had to tell your central bank. Where did those... And even here, the banks had to refuse it. But obviously because most of the banks were given the cop-out of paying fines, they took the money and paid a fraction of the receipts as fines and get to keep the money without the money being seized. Yeah. I don't want to mention names of names, but a uh, mention of banks, but you know the usual suspects. So it's, it beggars belief that that is the kind of framework that is around aid, uh, the IMF and African countries. And as the old African saying goes, when two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. In this case, you're talking about the African population. Not that they should be impoverished. It is just that the way 
the 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 game has been stacked. It's been stacked in such a way that they just cannot for that. Yeah. For embezzlement, corruption, and what have you. I I am one who subscribes to the uh, concept of naming names, pointing out where the harm is and who the oppressors are. I'm going to respect your choice not to do that, Brother Adesoji, but I'll also say that it is in this not mentioning, it is in the secrecy that the harm continues. When you when these people have a place to hide, we allow them to continue without being checked or, or uh, held accountable. But quickly before, because I do want us to, we're at 111, and I do want us to go to questions from the audience, but quickly, can you speak to the cost of resistance? Resisting this aid and resisting the debt that, aid and debt that Africa, because the two go along. It is because of the air aid and the terms uh, that the aid comes with, that Africa is currently in debt and continues to be the two feed each other. Um, Brother Ali Madi, what is the cost that we has, have seen in history of resisting aid and debt in Africa? The cost is uh, called Kwame Nkrumah, overthrown in 1966, uh, Patrice Lumumba, murdered in 1961, Sankara, assassinated in 1987, and many other examples of leaders who are marginalized. And then, of course, others that became fearful because they did not want to meet that same fate. Mm -hmm. They uh, challenged the system. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're just eliminated. And, you know, actually, I want to also add a, 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 another a comment to what Brother Disoji said, that when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. When Lee Kuan Yew, who was a very smart guy, brilliant, you know, prime minister of Singapore, heard this, and he was with Julius Nyerere also, <laughs> conference, you know, the Commonwealth Conference, I believe. I think it was in Ottawa that year. He said, but with all due respect, even when elephants make love, the grass suffers as well. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because we see them. Berlin Conference is what part of that, an exactly. example of that love, right? Exactly, which brings me to one other point I would like to make on the whole issue of you know, so-called foreign aid. One must always just remember one thing. What is the primary relationship with African countries and the industrialized countries, particularly the West? Mm -hmm. It is that of exploitation, pure and simple. So anything else has to be examined in that context. So, of course, foreign aid is one of the ways that the exploitation is maintained. Everything else is just a matter of details, but don't have any doubt. And I can give you another way to analyze it if somebody is still not convinced. Western industrialized countries are basically a collection of private corporations, right? Sure. Yep. Private corporations run these countries. So you have a collection of private corporations that is under the umbrella called the United States of America. Yes. Yep. You have a collection of private corporations that's under the umbrella of Great Britain mm -hmm. or France, etc. Right? So ask yourself, do you see any one of these companies helping another company so that they can grow and compete with them and mm -hmm. undercut their own profits? Never. So why would they come? to allow African countries to industrialize, become like China, and start competing with them. Will that ever happen? Look at the abuse that they hurl upon China every day now. Mm. You cannot pick up the economist every week and find, you will, you'll find anti-China article all over the place. <laughs> Not a single good thing <laughs> uh, to say about China. So that to me is the best example of foreign aid not being in any way related to allowing African countries to develop and to compete with the West. It will never happen. Yeah. When they get together to act collectively, these countries, or you could say these corporations because they're the same thing, it is to discuss how to exploit others, how to corner the market for resources or the market for consumers which is what the Berlin conference that you mentioned was exactly. They said, let's not fight amongst ourselves. Let's divide up the territory. You have the territory of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You have the territory of Senegal. They were making love. The territory of Mozambique. Mm -hmm. 
market share, right? Yeah. It's uh, as you talk about this, I remember myself and a fellow uh, Pan Africanist brother attended uh, an African uh, event last week in Philadelphia as part of the Udunde festivals. And one of the African representatives there asked, because they, they, they confronted this issue, um, the whole idea China, US, because they were talking about US trade and partnership with African nations. And they said China gives more money and China does not have conditions. And the U.S. representative, who looks like you and I, you would mistake them for being an African representative, says in defense of the United States that, uh, well, China's uh, loans are this way, but the United States loans are this way. But we've talked about all this harm that is related to United States um, and Western loans, which come in the form of aid. So there's no excuse, really, uh, and they need to, to respond to that question. Um, going to our community, Brother Milty Leonard asks, can we form an advocacy organization to fight these crippling restrictions? And we've talked about this before, Brother Alimadi, uh, as we were talking about creating the parallel, the organization parallel to the AU. If uh, both of you can speak to this. Well, the, the two separate things. At the end of the day, who controls government is very essential, right? because they negotiate with the outside world. So it's important that we have the people that uh, have the interest of the working people controlling the governments in African countries. You know, one example we've discussed, Thomas Sankara, just one government, you know, having correct policies made a significant difference for, not only for Burkina Faso, but inspired, you know, people throughout the African continent. So that gives you the example of what the correct government uh, can actually do. But then, of course, we've also discussed challenging the African Union in order to push them to do the right thing by creating sort of a people's African Union, a collection of conscious Africans that always intervene and comment intellectually on the burning issues of the day, but also whenever the African Union has its annual meeting, we, the unofficial African Union, or the People's African Union, we also have our parallel meetings and have the kind of discussions that the diplomacy prevents from having, happening within the official African Union, or the fact that many of them, they happen to be a collection or a club of autocrats. So they would not be interested in having a discussion that impacts in a positive way the lives of working people in Africa. Yes, uh, advocacy organization. Question is, yes, you can form one, but then you have to also understand that, just like Brother Milton said, you're competing for the ears of people in power. How are you going to bring them on side? The position will probably be to try and look for candidates and run, advocate those candidates to get into power as opposed to working with candidates that are already there. Because just like in the West, everybody has a price. And if you fund their campaign or fund their programs, they will chime for whatever it is you're talking about. So yes, it's, it's, um, it's a fantastic idea, but it needs to be one that is nurtured and organically grown. By that, I mean, say, for instance, you look into um, African universities and you look for bright students and you pay their tuition and you tell them, listen, look at your government. This is what we expect you to do when you come out of it. And you fund their campaign. They, obviously, once they come out and they know what the game is, they will stick to the master plan hopefully but largely they would so yes it's a brilliant plan and it's um it's one that can be you know that can be nurtured over time hmm. um we have from the audience a suggestion right there uh to discuss dr horn's book white supremacy confronted um we will look into that we will invite our brother horn dr horn and if he is watching this, if he gets to watch this, uh, reach out to us at Kumbukeni 
one at gmail.com. We would love to have you here. And like I said, I like, I mean, I've had him on my WBI show. He's one of the most brilliant, you know, historians in the United States, in the world, in fact, and a brilliant analyst of connecting all the pieces together as well. And he so, was, ba he was yes, based when we get a chance to read the book, we should yeah. have it. And he was based in Africa at the time, so he will be well grounded in. I have his book, and um, it's uh, how can I say? It? You mean at, at the time of writing this book? Sorry, he was based in Africa at the time of writing this particular book. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. In the okay. course of his travels, he's okay. been based in Africa, Sudan, Sudan, and Zimbabwe, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Those two, yeah, those two places, yeah. Yes. I'm looking through the chat to see any more questions. If both of you brothers see it. any questions, let me know. But if you want to continue speaking to what well, we're Juan, about... what's, what's crazy, how even Malcolm acts in his 1964-65 speech, he was talking about foreign aid to Africa as a racket, a front to recolonize Africa during what sometime, when he, that sometime he was traveling to Africa. Yes, 100%. Um, I'm doing a lot of research on Malcolm's travel to Africa right now. Mm -hmm. He warned, he said, I hope my African brothers do not fall into the captivity of dollarism, is what he called it. Uh, just having come out of European colonialism to fall into the control of the United States because of the power of the almighty dollar. So yes, Malcolm uh, was very prescient and very bright. And we are today discussing what Malcolm actually foresaw. Imagine that. <laughs> and speak in 1965. Uh, yeah, and speaking of uh, you know foresight, also um, Brother Walter Rodney mm -hmm. in his book How Europe Underdeveloped Africa said it is common colonial policy at the time that you produce whatever it is you produce is pushed out to the metropole, Imagine as he that. calls it. Mm -hmm. But then only a fraction of what you're produced is used in terms of your education. So your education, your educated elites were not supposed to fight for your liberation. They were supposed to carry on the jobs of the master, which points us to uh, a famous quote from, um, what's his name? Leopold Senghor of Senegal. When he was asked, uh, what is the goal here? Say, well, the goal is not to, is not African, African culture. No, 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 no. The goal is to produce black Frenchmen to be, to use his words exactly, to be the exact copy of French. Oh, oh, no, he said, it is a shame that we cannot blush. But if we could, oh, we'd be Lord. black Frenchmen. Yes, Talk yes. about self-hate. Yes. It's a shame that my skin is so dark you can't and, see me blushing. And he was, uh, he was the, the subject of so much lambasting in, uh, what's his name? The great man's book, Franz Fanon's uh, Black Skin, mm. White Man. When he says some of them will go to France and they will roll their tongue, waiter, can I have a bottle of wine? With, with pride too. And, you yep. know, and they come back to wherever it is they come from and they talk to you in French metropole slang mm. as if they've been there all their life. So much so that their parents and their, and their people around them cannot recognize who is speaking. They, we have a problem. Yeah. Another question from uh, U Akata. Um, has there... Um been some improvement since At Antoinette Monsio Saye became deputy managing director of IMF brothers. It's difficult for individuals to have significant impact uh, because, you know, the system structurally uh, would still be the same. Dr. Ka <laughs> always quotes that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on. I think to break from that nexus really is you need a very radical, you know, approach. You need to be able to renounce that type of relationship. And of course, there's a very high cost of renouncing that relationship. Of course. You know, they'll eliminate you. You have to be in a strong position to be able to do that. And of course, now uh, the possibility is uh, it's rearing its head with the uh, BRICS, you know, mm -hmm. 
the BRICS countries, the arrangement that, that uh, this new movement that includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And now there are many other countries that are knocking on the door to join BRICS. And BRICS is now discussing how to come up with their own currency so that they, are, they can move away with the dependence on the United States dollar. And of course, because of the uh, U.S. trying to dictate that uh, you cannot have an independent policy to the world when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, that is having uh, some um, benefits to countries that actually want to be uh, independent, uh, to move away from the domination of the United States and the United States dollar. So it's made BRICS, uh, it's increased uh, the likelihood publicity yeah. uh, of BRICS and interest in BRICS by other countries. Um, and if they are, this could be a process that can actually uh, continue to grow because at the end of the day, you need financing. Uh, for projects, for uh, to deliver social services, you know, but you need them not to have the kind of conditions that the World Bank and IMF imposes. Um, the World Bank and IMF, their objective will not change, not for the foreseeable future anyway. You know, they could become very effective if indeed their motive was to develop these countries. But of course, we can say that regarding other organizations, right? We could say mm -hmm. the United Nations, if it really fulfilled the obligations of its charter, the world would be a much safer and better place, correct? Yes. So that's the matter is that the United Nations is dominated by the countries of the Security Council, uh, uh, which is then, that means the United Nations is reduced to a contest between the United the, States and China, the Western countries mm -hmm. versus China. China and today versus Russia. Russia. You see, so and the rest of the possibilities for United Nations becomes neutralized mm. because of this domination. You see, the for me, the last time we were talking about costs, the last time the United Nations was impartial was during the reign of Dag Hammarskjöld. Dag Hammarskjöld would of course, meet a sad end when his plane crashed. At least that's the official report. The, the investigation has been reopened anyway. His plane crashed in the 60s after meeting with Patrice Lumumba, who will also meet a similar type fate in Congo in the 1960s. That was the last time the UN was impartial. Well, which br which I'm brings me... Sure. Hold on. Hold impartial. on. Which bring, <laughs> sorry? You have, you have to be careful when you say impartial. I mean, uh, because after all, they are the ones that stood by mm -hmm. as uh, Lumumba was, fell apart. Mm -hmm. uh, hauled away and killed. Yeah, but then that was yeah. after was Dagash Amashod was killed. Was it before or after? No friends, right? Yeah, These I people think, are not friends. I think as you yourself said in the beginning, mm -hmm. when these organizations were set up, mm. you know, they were set with the purpose and objective to push, <laughs> you know, the Western agenda. I think Hamashal himself as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe the correction, that's the correction. Exactly. Right. He yeah. was impartial. And I think that is why some people are not surprised that he ended up dying. Mm. Because mm. he actually wanted to try to do the right thing for, for, for the Africa. Congo. Yeah. And it came head on with the people that actually control the United Nations at the background. Because he was told not to go, actually. Yes. And, and as you speak of that, I remember to say to our family, the color of your skin is not necessarily indication um, of your intent yep. and your actions towards the well-being of Africa and Africans. Yep. Yep. And that book is important that he held up because that book is actually why the investigation was reopened. Was reopened, yes. By Susan uh, Williams, correct? Yeah, mm. that book points very clearly that this was no ordinary plane crash. Mm. This was an assassination because he actually wanted to be an impartial secretary general of the United Nations. 
but he was secretary general of an organization which was, of course, dominated Dead by by, by Western interest. Yeah, exactly. It's it, it, Susan Williams is one of those individuals I'm mentioning right now who do not look like African as we know Africans to look like, but who's done quite a bit. And the argument can be put out that she's making money from her books, which is true. She is making money, but, but she's she putting herself money. at yeah. huge yeah. risk. She's putting herself at a huge risk and her family and her loved ones for speaking the truth, for being authentic and speaking up against wrong without hesitating. So yes, she might make a buck or two from her books, but she is confronting an opp oppressive system and telling us exactly what's happening and informing us and educating. And we thank her for it. Um, again, thank you. Clear, Go on. Somebody who's not familiar with her, she's European is what you're trying to say. Yes. If, if it wasn't clear to any listener. Yes. Yeah, ba based on I'm based trying on not to give life to the idea of white. Um, I didn't say white. They, yeah, I know, but that's why I didn't say it. This is white. She's European. Thank you for that term. As we speak about terms that we should be careful about using. She's European. And unlike the history of Europeans who we've encountered, um, she has been on our side and we thank her for it. Right. So, the yes, yes, she has <laughs> not done that. We thank you all for coming. Asanteni. Uh, thank you for all the contributions in the chat. This is a collective uh, effort, and we appreciate everyone stepping in and actually taking ownership to the decolonizing of our minds collectively. Um, again, you can join us um, at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Kumbukeni. Join our Patreon family there. Um, you can follow us on youtube.com. Um, forward slash at kumbukeni1 by subscribing onto this channel. You can send us an email at kumbukeni1 at gmail.com. We are open to all sorts of ideas. We are open to having you join us for the conversation. Um, just reach out to us. Um, we want to be accessible to all of our community. And so that my brothers and I can have more time to dedicate towards the research and getting you this information support us so that we can free ourselves from the nine to fives and come here. Uh, to give you more information. We thank you all. Asanteni. Odigba Kono. Quiet.